Hi everyone, welcome again to Leaning In and Speaking Out. I'm Michelle Lamb, Dr. Jackie Kirk and I are talking today with two guests about ungrading. So I'll ask you both to introduce yourselves and then we'll jump right into the topic. I'll maybe start with you, Chris, if you might. Okay, my name is Chris Arconic and I'm a, a local teacher here at Crocus Plains uh, Regional Secondary School and I, I teach physics. So this is my was it third year on grading now, I believe it is. So it's been quite a little adventure. So. <laughs> okay, Ellen. Hi, I'm Dr. Ellen Watson. I'm an assistant professor at Brandon University. My area is science education and I've been using ungrading for the last couple of years in some of my uh, undergraduate classes. Awesome. So let's just start with what is ungrading and how did you get interested in it? You go ahead, Chris. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I went ahead and during the pandemic, we had all these shifts and everything else to to try and still accomplish learning while kids are not in front of us. And I wanted it to still be as authentic as possible. And so I didn't want them to just go home and say, I'll trust you all to read through the text and answer some questions that I upload onto whatever format. I want them to continue still doing the physics at home because I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity for that even during that time. So I started to try and figure out how do I measure their learning at that point because traditional tests don't really work in that environment or I just had to come up with something different. And so I, I'd already pr played around over the years with a couple of other different ways. And back in 2010, in my second year of teaching, I, I was exploring standards-based grading with a friend of mine and we're playing around with that and seeing some successes there. But also seeing some shortcomings. A few years, a couple of years later, I went ahead and uh, played around with gamification and looking at the whole concept of uh, not playing games in the classroom, but overlaying video game psychology onto the classroom. And, and that was actually really successful, but um, unfortunately, I packed that in a little bit early. I, I don't think I was quite resilient enough that early in my career, and I got a little bit of... Uh, um, negative feedback from some of the students that tended to excel. And so with this, I, I started combining the different aspects and blended it into my own version of ungrading after finding kind of this tremendous teacher network that's out there around the world. Yes. Yeah, so I see ungrading as a removal from focus on the teacher giving the grade. And I shift ungrading more into a space where students can check their own understanding. And I see it as really pushing the boundaries on metacognition. And for me, I use ungrading. I don't assign my students grades, but I live in a system where I do need to give a grade in the end, which is the tricky part about ungrading in most systems. So I, I also bring in self-grading on that. And for me, ungrading and self-grading and is really attractive because I think that there's a problem around using terms like uh, the grade you gave me is a certain thing. And I don't see grades as given. I see them as earned. So um, the idea that I'm giving a grade at all is really problematic for me. Also, I'm just not a fan of grading. And I can sit down and I can give feedback for hours. I love giving feedback to students. I love reading assignments for students. But as soon as I have to put a letter or a number on it, I'm just not motivated to do that because I feel like it's such a judgment factor. And then a lot of my feedback winds up being around this justification of the judgment. And I just don't see that as the purpose of grading. I agree a lot. The feedback isn't hard. The grade is hard. So talk to us about how you've used it in your classes and what kind of response your students give you. Yeah, so I've used it in, like I said, a couple of my undergraduate classes. Mm -hmm. And I do give students a rubric to say, this is what an A would look like in this class. This is what an A minus would look like in the class. But it's an overarching A or A minus for the whole year. So things like the student uses evidence to support their opinions about teaching throughout the course. And students have that rubric throughout the term, and I still give them assignments. They do their assignments, and then I give them feedback. And when I give them feedback, I try to point to those areas. You've done a really good job of using evidence. Or, oh, I see your ideas here, but you're really only using personal 
opinion to support them. So how can you extend that? And then students meet with me at midterm. They complete a self-reflection. And they meet with me at final, where they've also completed a self-reflection. And at those times, we negotiate the grade. Normally, it's what they give themselves or they're too hard on themselves. The occasional time, I'll get someone who overestimates a little bit. <laughs> but we sit down and we talk about how what they've done reflects in a grade and what grade they think should be represented on their transcript. Thank you. And for me, like I've used it for the last couple of years with my 11 and 12 physics classes. And I've seen at the high school level the same sorts of things where it's putting forward that feedback is more natural and trying to force some sort of grade to it. If you start nitpicking the minus half marks here and the half marks there and all of a sudden it becomes, are you really assessing what the kids understand or are you now, okay, you've gone ahead and nitpicked away 20% of their grade. <laughs> and for my implementation of it, I, I've tried to develop something that focuses on the bigger picture, focuses on their problem solving skills and the those underlying pieces to actually being able to do the physics as opposed to the content itself. In my classroom, it's underpinned by almost a skills-based grading as opposed to a standards-based grading. So what skills do they need to be successful? And then from there, we've co-constructed a, a criteria of, okay, what does a 40 to a 50 look like? What does a 50 to a 60 look like? And so on. And students know from day one what sort of standard they need to maintain in the classroom to get to where they want to be. And it's, it, it, the response to it has been tremendous because mm -hmm. now there's this basis in equity for the entire room where everyone's on the same playing field, everyone's working towards whatever their personal goals are. It's, so it's been really well received. I, I was afraid with some students that uh, I think one of the biggest detriments to traditional grading is how many students base their self-worth on that number that shows mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. and how that can undermine learning when they're so desperate to achieve it. And they resort to, to methods that don't last in terms of long-term learning. And so with this, seeing the students progress from grade 11 into grade 12 and, and how little uh, loss there is during that time uh, compared mm -hmm. to what they're used to be, it's just been phenomenal. And then seeing their growth throughout the year and that response to the feedback rather than Again, if the number's on the paper and the feedback's there too, most of them just chuck it in their binder and don't really pay attention to it. So that number undermines that aspect. And, and now I see this level of growth and progression throughout the entire semester. Yeah, and there's research out there too saying that when students have a grade and feedback on the same paper, th the feedback is ignored. Mm -hmm. They don't engage with it. Some things I like about ungrading are my students can engage with it. If they do a lesson plan and I give them feedback and say, these are all the things that I think could be improved, and they bring it to midterm or final meeting and say, hey, I took what you suggested and this is how I changed it, that's a way more powerful learning experience than just saying, okay, you got the A on the lesson plan mm -hmm. and moving on. I find that students... I do have some that don't buy in right away, and it's usually the students who are very good at the game of school. Mm -hmm. It's usually the students who know how to get the A, and I'll get feedback saying, I understand better when you tell me my grade, but I do push back on that because I see it as, do you really understand better, or do you just, you want the gold star from the teacher? And I, I think that our system conditions Mm -hmm. students to that and when I see them they've already they've completed however many years of school plus their undergraduate degree plus some on top of that for many of my students so it takes a long time to unlearn those behaviors. Mm -hmm. How do parents respond at the high school level? I've had over the last three years I've had I think three parents out of all the students that I've taught that are resistive to it. The vast majority That's of parents good. have been, why haven't we been doing this all along? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I, I was always afraid about that response because it is so different from what we traditionally do. But when you explain to them that if you walk into my physics classroom, how much physics should you really know on day one? And you really shouldn't know much if I'm providing a challenging course that gives you something that's worth learning. And, and that you want to, to work towards and have these goals of. If, 
a student can go ahead and walk in and day one or, or quiz number one or whatever you want to call it, can go ahead and start knocking off hundreds, then am I really challenging them to their limits? Mm -hmm. Am I really going ahead and trying to instill in them that quest for learning, that quest for understanding? Or am I just going ahead and giving them a course that, okay, yeah, the ones who know how to play the game of school, yeah, they can start knocking out those hundreds right away. And the ones who just aren't as savvy at it, they struggle and they'll struggle from day one to day 85. Mm -hmm. So, so when I go ahead and I start running that whole bit by parents and say, here's the criteria that we base the grade on and I email it home to parents so they can see it as well. And we'll have two conferences that will almost be like job interviews where the student has to advocate for themselves, show their entire portfolio of learning, show their growth, show what they've done to try and improve throughout the course. And you know what? We won't have much in, in terms of our LMS our, our for grades, but you know what? You want to know where your child's grade is? Sit down with that exact same portfolio and have a conversation with them. If they can justify it to you, they can justify it to me. Mm -hmm. And that tells you both where the learning's at and what needs to be worked on and how to get to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So it's actually been a, a really tremendously positive response from parents, which... Yeah, may maybe the skeptic in me was rather unsure of initially. <laughs> when you talked about there being some pushback with the gamification that you first implemented years yeah. ago, do you think the difference is that you're communicating differently now with parents and students, or do you think it's the gamification versus ungrading? I, I think with the gamification, there were so many different layers to it yeah. that you're trying to start you're still grading, but now you're starting points at zero and accumulating. Okay. That's one strategy where students always see that everything they do is worth something, right? That has value. But at the same time, that's still reinforcing that transactional methodology mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the classroom where it's, okay, if I do work, where's my payment, yeah. right? And they're used to that being in the form of a grade. So it's effective in manipulating that a little bit better so that, say, more struggling students can go ahead and buy into that and not mm -hmm. feel as punished by it. But then the students who are used to playing that game of school and used to seeing those high marks right off the start, they were just they absolutely hated it. They didn't care that it was a different approach and that there's all these positives to it and that everyone in the room had a better shot. It still threw that out the window. With this, the approach is a lot more, a lot easier for more people to get on board. Yeah, makes sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the two of you are doing some research together. So do you want to tell us about your research with ungrading? Sure. Chris and I met at a Manitoba Association of Physics Teachers meeting online. And I was like, hey, you're from Brandon. I'm from Brandon <laughs> because most of the people are not from Brandon on there. We should meet and we should chat because I was new to Manitoba and I wanted to get to know some teachers in the province. And so when we started talking, he was telling me about the ungrading that he was doing in his class. And I was like, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do some research on that? And Chris said, absolutely, I do. <laughs> we sat down and we thought about you know, what? what is ungrading doing that we can look at? And the response from the stories that I heard from Chris was obvious that students liked it. So could we look at students' perceptions about ungrading? Sure. But there's lots of work done out there on that. So it wasn't something that we'd really be looking at new things. And one of the criticisms about ungrading is that there's not a lot of empirical studies beyond this perception piece. Mm -hmm. We decided to look at ungrading from a motivational perspective. How does it manifest in motivation or how do, is motivation changed as a result of ungrading? And so we are taking, we're looking at ungrading through self-determination theory. So how does it impact students' autonomy? How does it impact their connectedness? How does it impact their competence? <laughs> and so we have since finished collecting our data and we're working on analyzing it, but initial anal analysis is really showing some interesting things in the areas of autonomy. So so hmm. students are seeing ungrading as giving them more autonomy and, and giving them more control over their learning and what they want to explore further. It's, it's a more open space. They can look at what they're interested in. It's also helping their perceived competence. So specifically with those students who don't necessarily see themselves as achieving well in sciences. So we did ask them, do you think your science grade generally reflects how you're doing in science. And the high achievers all say, yeah, it reflects how I'm doing. 
I do really well in science. But those, those middle road achievers, we don't have very many low achievers in our sample, but the middle road achievers, they said it sometimes shows what my understanding is. It shows how much work I put in, those kinds of things. And then when we ask them at the end of this course, do you think that your grade shows your level of understanding? It's yes. Yes, this shows how well I understand physics. And so mm -hmm. they're able to, you know, better calibrate their understanding. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily have this data included, but Chris has a great story about his final exams. So he gave a final exam before he did on grading yeah. with his grade 12 physics class, and he did the same final exam this past year. Yeah. Past, yeah. yeah. And the grades were basically the same. Yeah. So students' achievement levels were basically the same in both forms. And the thing that you have to remember there is that when I first started teaching uh, physics five years ago at Crocus, it was very, it very much had a stigma around it of only the academic elite in the building mm -hmm. dare take mm -hmm. physics, mm -hmm. right? Very much that I only had classes of maybe 10 to 15 students where, you know, they were all your extremely driven, extremely hardworking, stuff like that, but also good at playing the game of school, also very naturally gifted, very, all these things going for them already. The students who maybe struggled a little bit would never dare think of taking physics. Mm -hmm. And in the time since, I now have a program that's expanded tremendously. Right now, I started teaching physics five years ago. I had basically the school offered the, the bare minimum. So one section of grade 11 per semester and one section of grade 12 per semester. The grade 11 courses maybe hit 20. The grade 12 courses maybe hit 10, 12 students per course. Now I'm one section shy of being a full-time physics teacher this year. And so yeah. the overall numbers have gone up to where I think I've got almost 70 students enrolled in grade 11 right now, and I've got about a 90 to 95 percent retention rate into grade 12. Wow. And a lot of students are trying it just for the sake of trying it. Uh, they're not afraid anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think my, some people might say well, your population's increased, which is true, but that retention rate is really important mm -hmm. because in physics, being somebody who taught physics, we saw a lot of people start and not necessarily finish that grade 11 course. So to have them not only finishing grade 11, but taking grade 12. But thinking they could do grade 12. Like that's saying like something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ability. That's huge. That's yeah. the, the competence piece we're looking at, Jackie. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. <laughs> It's cool when the personal stories line up with what you're seeing in the data, too, yeah. right? Yeah. That's satisfying in a research <laughs> kind of way. And I wonder if we could just go from there to thinking about how this affects EDI or equity, diversity, and inclusion. Like you've mentioned it a little bit, Chris, but do you want to yeah. say any more about that? And that's the thing is that with this approach, like I said before, it's more equity-based. All students start with the same sort of playing field, right? It's... Anyone can learn. Anyone can achieve to high levels. It's not what the traditional system usually communicates, where it's you're expected to be perfect right from the start because mm -hmm. absolutely everything is averaged together, which communicates to students very directly and very loudly. What do you really value in the classroom? Do you value growth or do you value anxiety-inducing perfection from day one? Mm -hmm. And so with this model, it's more about... I want to see where you're at by the end of the course. I want to see what you can do. What, how good of a problem solver are you at that point? And focusing on that, there's no averaging between our two conference grades. It's where are you at midterms when we have to provide a grade for the midterm report card? Mm -hmm. Where are you at today? Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple months later, all right, we're getting ready for final exams. Where are you at as we end the course? Mm -hmm. Anyone can see high levels of growth. Anyone can start at a 50 or a 60 in a more broadly challenging program and then live up mm -hmm. to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. I find that I'm able to get more students regardless of their background. Like nowadays I have students, it used to be students coming only from pre-calc or AP calculus signing up mm -hmm. for physics programs. Now I've got students coming from essentials math and applied math, going ahead and trying it and seeing how it goes. And finding a tremendous amount of success. Mm -hmm. They feel part of something that they can be successful in. And I've also gone ahead and combined it with things like a lot of thinking classrooms approaches from Peter Liliadal mm -hmm. and that interconnectedness that it brings about the room with randomized groups and everyone getting to know each other. 
from grade 11 to grade 12, grade, by grade 12, they're almost like one big family. They all know each other so well. <laughs> um, and everyone feels like they belong. Nobody feels like they're not right. part of something. Yeah. And so that combination has just been absolutely tremendous. Um, I, I've done thinking classrooms in the past with just traditional grading or with standards-based grading, and the grading aspect tends to undermine it. They're not as willing to go ahead and work with anyone when there's this grade riding on how well they do. Mm -hmm. it, it loses that, and this approach goes ahead and just opens the door for everyone to just feel part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. So... You know, something I haven't, and I'll come back to your EDI question in a second, but something I haven't done yet with ungrading is group work. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really thought about how that would play out, but I think it would be mm. interesting because something I've seen in my classes is students are far more likely to take risks and they're more likely to try different things. And when I'm in an ungrading space, because they know they're going to get a chance to sit down and say, this is what I learned from it. But I, I wonder how that would play out into group work whether or not that might ease some of the tension in group work. <laughs> um, for EDI, I think even if you're taking UDL principles, it meets a lot of the boxes. It Students have to set goals. They have to say when they're reaching goals. They have to monitor them their own learning. They, it's a very easy way to respond to calls to EDI. Mm -hmm. I also, in my experience, when students are coming from other countries, sometimes they struggle in our system because the Canadian system can be very different from some spaces. I had a student this year who was from South America in one of my un ungrading classes, and they did okay on the assignments they submitted, and I gave them feedback on it. And then when we sat down and had our discussion, they just started busting out work from Paulo Freire and started talking about critical mm. theorists. And this student knew what they were talking about. So they didn't necessarily get a chance to show that in the work that they had, but they definitely knew about instruction mm -hmm. and that class. So in having the chance to meet with them, I was able to get a sense of that. Yeah. And that was something interesting that I've seen too, is with our school, we get a lot of EAL students coming in as well. And I had one from Syria, I believe it was last year, who came in knowing very little English. And she said that combination of being able to, to take those risks and the randomized groupings and having to talk to people and having to communicate. And she said that her English, she attributes more improvement to this program than to her EAL <laughs> shelter content program, uh, which is really amazing to see and not something I ever dreamed of being the case. But again, another huge positive, right? Yeah. When you remove that competition, it really opens mm -hmm. the space for yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. equitable learning. Assessment is one of the things that I've worried about throughout my career, and it's been on my professional growth plan since the beginning, because I still don't feel like I have it right, um, and I still worry about it every time I have to do it. How do you think this changes assessment going forward? I think that one still has to be very purposeful in their assessment with this, and, and I do think that you need to have a good understanding of what you think assessment means and a good definition. But if you have that, I think that it really opens the space for more flexible assessment. And I think that it opens the space for less pressure and maybe we can move away from grades as currency and actually start thinking about learning again. Mm -hmm. That's really what I've enjoyed about it and why I'm like, yeah, you need to try this, think about it because it allows students to learn. And in my final meetings, when I ask students, what'd you like about this? Would you do it again? That's what I hear from them. I, I learned in this class because I wanted to learn about it. I don't know if I answered your question, but. No. <laughs> you went all around it. <laughs> honestly, if, if I'm to be very blunt, I hope that honestly showing that Different models like this that are sometimes drastically different mm -hmm. means that maybe maybe we're on the precipice of an end to this 100-year failed experiment of traditional grades. Mm -hmm. uh, I One of the big things that made me really take this up was uh, I have a 3-year-old and a 6-year-old at home. And 
I look at what I went through for schooling. I look at what, you know, the stories my parents told of what they went through for schooling. And it tends to just stay the same. And if my kids still go through the same thing and nothing has evolved in 60, 70 years, then I feel like something's broken along the way. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we're on the edge of a huge shift in assessment going into the future, that this is just the start of something, the next evolution of education, something far better. I, I think it's also an achievable shift, not, uh, I think some people get scared if they hear PBL or things like mm -hmm. that and, okay, I have to throw out everything that I've ever done and start again from scratch. But I think that this is something that a lot of teachers I've seen buy into as well and that they can see a shift with what they have access to that can be meaningful and inspire deeper learning with their students. Thank you. <laughs> is there... Does it mean anything for curriculum and pedagogy? I oh. think, uh, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I think it opens us space for risk. So it does allow us to really think about teaching more. One of my biggest pet peeves when I was in the physics classroom was students coming to me and saying, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? Because they were fo so focused on being right. And it's partly the nature of the subject. Mm -hmm. But I still see that in education when they create a lesson plan. Is this right? Is this what you want? Is this right? And those questions are very problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think getting them to think about, getting my pre-service teachers or, or whoever's engaging with this to think about assessment as not necessarily being right, but as being a reflection of how you've grown or changed over the semester really does imply changes to curriculum and pedagogy because now we can think about teaching not to a predefined standard but teaching for growth and I think that would make a big difference. Honestly that's one of the more satisfying things that I've noticed in the classroom is it's gone from those students that always say is this right or, or the dreaded at the end of the year what can I do to bump up oh. my mark just a little <laughs> yes, bit more yes. right <laughs> and now students feel safe enough that when they're working in groups and things like that I'll say okay let's go ahead and stop this question here and let's take a look at it and they're like no we want to figure it out on our own can you just leave us alone for another 10 minutes we want to go ahead and it shows where their risk-taking is now at. Mm -hmm. It's not about that right all the time as much. It's, it's well, about it that growth. It shows the depth of their learning and their knowledge, yeah. right? That they don't feel like they're like out of yeah. tools or out of ideas to solve it. Absolutely. That they're feeling like they have more ability to keep talking about it and that eventually they'll find the path. Yeah. Well, that resilience yeah. is so much higher. Yes. Like, I'm willing to try this. And I've, you know, I had some students that I taught in my ungrading class last semester that I'm now teaching in my non-ungraded class. And I see them thinking, like, the ungrading, I use the same rubric, but one was for feedback and one has a grade attached. And they still want to know, am I meeting these points on the rubric in this new class? In the other one, they were just like, I'm going to try something, and I know you're going to give me feedback on it. So we're just going to go with this and try it, And which is what it's like when you're teaching, right? And now they want to because they're so worried about that grade and they just don't have that resilience to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And I think once they get beyond the education system, that's what they need more than anything, right? You leave the education system, you're not sitting there being constantly evaluated with a number point scale and <laughs> being told, okay, you're operating at an 89 right now, <laughs> but to keep your job or to get a raise, we need to see you bump up to a 92. It, it's... I think that this also brings a, a level of authenticity to it that's much more in line with what's going to come beyond, right? So, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And just going back and speaking about curriculum, like one of the things I've also noticed there with the physics is that when I first started teaching it five years ago at our school, a lot of it ended up being very superficial. And now I'm able to get it to a point where all students are capable and happily answering these deep thinking questions mm -hmm. and and just that depth of understanding has gone up exponentially. Uh, I'm having to dig into 
questions from AP curricula for my regular courses because that's just where they're coming to naturally at this point. And you have students getting excited about stuff that yeah. you don't necessarily get excited about. Like oh, I know. We, in our research, <laughs> one student was like, I really liked uniform circular motion. And so I really want, I did a project on it because I liked it so much. And Chris and I both looked at each other. That's the topic <laughs> that you wanted to go into. Yeah. But with ungrading, they absolutely can because I can figure out how to work that into our portfolio for them to do that. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there saying, okay, I light a tube on fire to show them sound waves and flames and measure the speed of sound. And I'm like, circular motion circular it is, motion. you know, all yeah. right. That's, uh, <laughs> that's apparently what you enjoy really? as the highlight of the course. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, there's a few things that caught me by surprise doing this. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I I love that. And I love the enthusiasm that you're both bringing. I think mm -hmm. you, can, you can hear it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks so much for coming. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on ungrading. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Just, just try it. Try it. <laughs> just, just try it. it. Any yeah. level, just try it. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of stuff out there about how to get started and how you might try things. And I think some of the biggest conversations would be going to administrators who aren't necessarily open to it mm. in the K-12 to system, and that could be a whole podcast on its own. But <laughs> if you have the space, try it. Start small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I'm of the same opinion. I, I think that throughout my career, this is probably one of the single greatest decisions that I've made is moving to this system. Mm. The benefits that it's brought my students and, and seeing that that passion that gets ignited in them when they don't have that um, psychological torment of the grade going ahead and, and pursuing them at all times, you know, or feeling like they have to perpetually be perfect or meet a certain level to keep their parents happy or things like that. Mm -hmm. It's everyone's understanding where it's coming from. It puts everyone out in a better headspace, a better mindset. And yeah, I just... Yeah, I can't say just try it as loudly enough <laughs> as I possibly can. And I, I've been fortunate to to impart some of my experience and, and some of my approach through BTA's lift program here for the last mm. couple of years. And, and the turnout for ungrading has been incredible. And the questions and the excitement from other educators wanting to try it. And it gives me a tremendous hope that Maybe this, like I said before, is that precipice where we're standing ready for a shift. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. If you have ungrading resources or the things that you pointed to, like ways to get started, we'll put them in the show notes so that we can share them with people. So yeah. Great. Absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks.